you so much. Um, okay, again, thank you so much for uh, coming in early to speak to my first period class today. Um, we've been talking about the structure of school and the different roles um, in, a, in, a, in a school. So if you could start by telling us about your role at our school and how you got to where you are. Sure. I'll just start by where, um, how I got to where I'm. Actually, I started as a, um, I was in the private sector for a little while, then I got out, I started coaching football. So I got out and um, eventually got into um, teaching. Um, the one thing that a lot of people don't know about me that I started out in elementary. I was an elementary teacher, um, grades four, fourth and fifth. I taught fourth grade one year and fifth grade two years. Um, so, and then I um, eventually moved up to here to the high school level and became a dean. And I was here for, I did a dean for like eight years and then eventually got into the role that I'm in now as assistant principal. Uh, my duties here, what I do is my main thing is school safety, uh, facilities, maintain um, administration here at the school so that it runs smoothly every day. Kids are safe, teachers are safe. That is actually the number one priority um, of administrations to make sure that everybody is safe and they get here safe and get home safely. Um, also, I take care of athletics. I am in charge of all the athletics. I'm also a head of the um, social history and science. I, they change me so much. I get forget NPE. Don't forget that. Those are also um, things that I head up also. So um, when you say that you are in charge of um, the facilities, what are some of the things that you do to manage the facilities on our campus? Um, the things that I do is just like, if I use your room, for example, if there's, your door is not open correctly, you would send me an email and I would make sure that we get, I get hold of maintenance so they can come and fix it. Also the little things that even to where the toilet is overflowing, we go in and fix that. I sometimes do that myself. Um, just make sure that the grass is being cut, make sure it is being maintained, make sure that all um, rooms have enough chairs and tables, just that, just the little basic stuff that seems so minute, but it's very huge. Right, absolutely. Um, and so then for the safety aspect of it, did you, were you uh, responsible for coming up with a lot of the safety protocols or at least managing the rollout of the protocols this year? Yes, um, I, it was a group effort. I had some, we each had individual parts that we did um, due to this thing that called COVID <laughs> that we had to come up with different procedures. As you can see, the, 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 the hallways is all one way now. You only can go in one door out the other. Um, also where the county also put in some rules that we had to implement also about the seating, those different types of things. Just make sure that the mask, kids and teachers have on masks every day, daily. <laughs> So most, some of it came from the county and quite a bit of it, just a little stuff like the cafeteria, the new setup of the cafeteria, that came from me and Mr. Hackett, we did that. Um, the setup for like football games came, uh, I'm talking basketball games where we got to do the bleachers, have X's and blue paint tape, that came also from me. So quite a bit of stuff came from myself, but most of it was a team effort. And then with the athletics, um, how do you, what do you do when you're managing the athletics for our school? What I do is um, I be, talk with Mr. Um, Mr. Nixon quite often. He's, he's our athletic director. We communicate quite often about the different thing um, going on with the athletic events. Make sure that all athletic events are scheduled correctly. We have the referees. We have the game times correct. Um, make sure that teams have the necessary materials that they need, as in like uniforms, all the way down to a band-aid just to make sure that they have everything they need. Also make sure the fields are in good condition so that it's playable, um, making sure that it gets fertilized, watered, make sure maintenance comes in and make sure it's cut. That's with the gym, make sure that the video is working so games can be recorded. Also that the floor has been waxed so you know somebody won't get hurt. And just maintain, make sure the bleachers are safe and, don't, and those different types of things. Um, what were some of the things you had to do um, when you were coming from the classroom as a classroom teacher to being a dean and now an assistant principal? What were some of the things that you had to do to get that role? Well, the main thing you have to do as a teacher, you have to put in three years to be um, to actually be considered for a dean position. So 
a lot of my teaching skills is what I use as a dean, uh, just communicating with students. The main thing, the main thing that I have learned over the past is that you have to build relationship with kids, have to build relationship with students. That's the lasting impression that, that they get from you. Um, and as a teacher, you know that. Because one thing that I do get from time to time when I'm in stores, I see former students, they, if you built a relationship with them, they will come back and talk to you. So my main thing with teaching is building relationships and so that they, so that you can communicate with them and they can communicate with you. Also, there was, you know, I took some of my um, things that I did with teaching and brought it to a dean. I was taught by quite a few people that was here, a dean before I was. It's just that you have to, you have to have structure and structure is huge. Because what, everybody wants structure. I mean, adults, students, everybody wants to know what's the next thing we're doing, how we're gonna do it, when we're gonna do it, and what time we're gonna do it. So once that, the structure is set in place and the kids and the students know the routine, then it becomes a lot easier. And just like in a classroom, they know what they're gonna do today, what they're gonna do tomorrow. Then, then you throw surprises at them and, and let them have a great day, a fun day. So that everything is just not work, work, work. Yeah, true. Um, you mentioned a little bit about how your, your coaching and your teaching have shaped your job now, but what about your experience as a student in school? How has that experience shaped your um, approach to your job as a school official? Well, I've seen how, how I acted in school and then now here I am sitting in this role. I guess I gave some people a lot of trouble at times, <laughs> I imagine. So, but it's different. You, you tend to see the things from a different angle, a different light. Um, as a student, you're just trying to find yourself you're trying to find your way through life, trying to find your niche, trying to find your friends. You're actually trying to figure out what you want to do once you get in Grady, let, let you become a junior and a senior. But as I became an administrator, I noticed that, wow, I actually did those things that really didn't make sense. Why did I do that? Why did I do this? And, and sometimes in my role, I have to take a step back and be like, okay, now you did the same thing they did. So you really can't come down a hard up hard on them as, as you as you want to because I have to remember I once was their age and some of the things that they do I did I also did also you know trying to not come to school leave campus I wasn't I wasn't the morning star of, 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 the, of, the, of the class I can tell you that I had my time in troubles yeah um so what would you say are the easiest parts of your job and what are the hardest parts of your job? The hardest part of my job, I'll start first, is, is actually dealing with parents and, and trying to make sure that we, uh, we, 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 we treat them as customers and make sure that they're satisfied, that they understand what's going on with their kid. And parents can be a little difficult, I can tell you. They can be a little difficult. And I understand it. I'm a parent also. Every parent wants the best for their kid, and they're going to fight for the best for their kid. But sitting in my role, I have to look at both parts. I have to look at what's best for the school and also what's best for the kid. So you kind of get in a little, I don't call it a shouting match. I just call it a little tanglement. But you, they're, they're fighting for their kid. I'm also fighting for their kid. But I'm also fighting to make sure that the school maintains the, the things that we have to do to make sure their kid graduate. The easiest part of my day, of the, my day and the kid, is just being around kids. I mean, and talking to them, That that's the... That's the reason why I'm here. It's not because of me um, and because of the kids to make sure that that they get what they need because I know it's rough out here in this real world once they leave here. It's, it's not as easy as they kind of think it is. Uh, things get a little bit difficult. Now, now you become what I always call the big word, the big R word. You're now responsible for yourself. And a lot of students are not ready to be responsible for themselves because they've been dependent on their parents for so long. But, you know, parents be like, hey, you're 18 now, it's time for you to grow. And, and that's the thing that I think that most kids have to understand is understand that big R word, that responsibility. It's so much on it, especially as you grow older, you tend to get married, you tend to get a family. Now everything is on you. And I kind of see what my dad went through when, when I was growing up, you know, the things that he had to do, actually, I see myself doing a lot of that now and never thought I would, but I do have a family myself. I have three kids myself. So I have to make sure that they're, they're safe. 
they have their needs and it's the same. And that's why I just tell most kids, you know, when they become seniors, start being responsible for yourself and it will help you once you get on to college or even if you don't want to go to college, whatever you choose to do in your career. Yeah. Um, uh, what would be one thing in education, if you could change one thing in education, what would it be? I testing, testing, by far testing. We test way too much testing um, and put in um, social skills. I think we have gotten away from social skills in the school. I know when I was in school, I was taught social skills and there's a that's missing in our society today with our young kids and our students is social skills because we're so caught up in testing. We're testing for this, testing for that, but we're not teaching them how to be social. We're not teaching them the little basic things. I imagine if you ask some of them, how do you write a check? How do you write a letter? How do you how do you address an envelope? Those little things have just basically went by the wayside, but those are still things that are still relevant today. Um, writing down, sitting down, writing a letter. You have to write a letter. You have to do this. You have to do that. So I would say stop all the testing. I understand testing, but I don't understand as much testing as we're doing. I think we do just a little way too much testing, a little way too much. That's kind of oxymoron. <laughs> way too much testing. But but I think we need to put in some social skills, like something like teaching them how to manage their money once they get in school, how to balance a checkbook, which we don't have to do it anymore. They do that. You know, how how to one is how to fill out an application for a car, how to fill out an application for a job, how to fill out an application for, to the procedures of buying a house. You know, those little things, the procedures of getting a loan, things that things that are more relevant to today in real life. I think we need to bring in more real life situation, things that they that students understand and relate to. than you know, we're sitting there testing, 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 and it's, and it's, it's a bunch of memorization. Yeah, definitely. Um, I did ask you to uh, create some questions. So are there any questions you guys would like to add? Gabe? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, Yade was speaking to your uh, point about bringing in more classes that deal with life skills and helping students deal with real world situations. If students were to gather together to make a petition, do they have any sway with you guys to help make that happen? Sure, yes, they do. Um, we try to make our classes that we choose that is not mandated for us to give. Let me let me say that. We have some things that state that the state of Florida say and the Polk County School Board say this is what we have to do. Mm -hmm. But we do have some classes that we can interact with and change and make ourselves. Sure, we would love to have their input on things um, that is more relevant to them that will help them. That then that gives us more um, practice of what we need to help them. So if they want to send some recommendations in. But the thing about it is, the one thing about it is that, I'll actually use a prime example before I get to that. Um, Russian, we had kids come to us about Russian. So, but we have to have enough people for the class. That is the key to making a class. I can have five students say they want to do a life skill class, but I can't have a, a class just five students. If I have 20 to 25 students in it, then that's a huge difference. Now that class can be made. So that's the one key about it. You have to have enough kids to go into the class to make the class. So I know sometimes they say, well, can we have this and have that? But if we only have three or four kids, 10 kids wanting it, we can't do that because we're just too large of a school to have a class of 10 people. If we were smaller, then that would be different. But we're sitting at 3,100 kids. It's just we can't have one class with 10 kids in it. Okay, so right. that's the main thing that needs to happen when they want to have a class, make sure they have the students and the people to go into the class that is willing to go with them. Yeah, for sure. Um, great question, great question, Yay. Uh, other questions? Other questions, guys? Trina. In three words, in three words, how would you describe being an assistant principal? Awesome, rewarding, and tiring at times. <laughs> um, 
I'm just writing this down for our notes here. It can get very, very tiring those long Friday nights when we're here all night. So it does get tiring. Can you, um, what is the expectation as an assistant principal uh, for doing those long nights? I mean, I, I don't, with teachers, we have set contract times that we're supposed to be here, but with assistant principals, what is the expectation for that? I'll just, a typical Friday uh, football game, um, we're all here, um, deans, assistant principal, principal, we're all at home games. You should, you will see all of us every home game. Away games, we have an option. We can go if we want. Um, it's just, just an option that, that we have. But all home games, we are required to be here because it's just such a large venue and, and this, we need as many people as we can to help monitor. Yeah. Any other questions, guys, for Mr. Lewis? Okay. Yeah. Um, the question is, school starts very early in the morning for most of our students. What do you think about the school start time? Should it remain the same or should we start later? No, I'm not a morning person. <laughs> No, I am not a morning person. And, and if you ask any assistant principal, am I a morning person? And they'll tell you, no, I, I prefer school to start at 8, 830. I'm, Cause I'm not a morning person. So if I could change it, yes, I would change it because getting up at five in the morning is just not cool for anybody. Yeah. So yeah, I would I change it. But then if you ask Ms. Robinson, Mr. Hackett and Ms. Clark, they will tell you they're fine because they're morning people. They're up and moving. Me, I'm not a morning person. Catch me about nine o'clock. I'm good then. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. brings up the point that a lot of teenagers have jobs after school. Um, and that early morning wake up can really disrupt their education and learning because they're uh, so tired in the morning. Um, for well, that let me issue. speak about that. Yes, I'll speak please. about that. Jobs is optional for some and jobs are mandatory for others. And I understand each family situation. But we have to understand that you also need an education. So, and, and I'm going to speak of this. We have to make sacrifices in life to get where we want to go. And I say it all the time, unless you, if, unless you sacrifice something, you're going to be stagnant and you're not going to move. You know, I, I sacrificed a lot to get to where I'm at. Um, I sacrificed even in, I, actually I played college football. So I did a lot of sacrifices getting up five o'clock in the morning, going to lift weights because I had a, because I wanted that scholarship to pay for my school. So we have to make sacrifices that we don't want to. And I understand working, and I understand going to school, but what is the most important thing to you? And that's what you have to ask yourself. What is the most important thing to me? Is my job more important than my education or is my education more important than my job? And if you choose to say your job is more important than your education, then you need to go come speak with us and let's see how we can help you to, to motivate, to get you on to where you wanna be. But if your education is important, that's called sacrifice. You have to sacrifice working time, getting up in the morning, coming to school. and But those pay off in the long run because it gives you a great work that, can, that will carry you on throughout life. And it also gives you a great sense of entrepreneurship because now you know what it is to work for somebody and then you see now I wanna work for myself. So th it's a, that's the kind of, to me, it's a 50-50 toss up. It just depends on what are you looking for and what do you wanna do, but Sacrifice is a key to everything. And that's something that you all will need to understand. You're gonna sacrifice a lot. And a lot of those things that you sacrifice are your friends, your time going out, having fun with them in order to get to where you wanna go. I sacrificed a lot to get to where I'm at. Um, I actually, I, was a, I played college football. I actually, you know, I played high school football. So there was things that I couldn't do that my friends did because I couldn't put myself in certain situations because it would take my scholarship away from me. And I know my parents couldn't afford to send me to school. So times that I wanted to go party, I couldn't go party. The times I wanted to go hang out, I couldn't go hang out because I knew 
if something happened, we got in trouble that I was going to lose my scholarship and I was going to have to come home. So you have to make sacrifices and it pays off in the long run. But I know as young teenagers, you don't see that. You don't see that right now. I didn't see it either. But now since I'm here in my position, I see the sacrifices that I made. It actually paid off. Lewis, um, 2020 obviously has been such a, a crazy year for everybody. Um, what is the main thing that has changed for you this year with all of the, the new restrictions and the and the COVID protocols? What has made has been the main change for you in your job at school? Humanity. Um, humanity has changed a lot. You, you see things different now um, because you have people that are dying from this, from this disease. And, and you see people every day and you don't know what are, how do they feel? Like I'm looking at you now, how are you feeling today? You know, are you okay? Are, are their family okay? You tend to look beyond just the surface of, pers of a person and you try to get more detail and deeper into that person now. So that has changed a lot for me, being a little bit more um, humanity, I guess that's how you want to say it. Um, checking on people a lot more often than what I used to, um, not taking anything for granted now um, since this has happened. So I, I've learned to I've learned to be a little bit more, um, what's the key word I'm looking for? I wouldn't say friendly um, for that, but you just have to now check on, check on individuals, make sure that they're okay um, so that so that you just have a peace of mind yourself because you know you have friends and family that are older you have grandparents you have aunts that are a lot older like i do so you just got to make sure that they're okay and just be more cautious of what you're doing what you're doing yourself um to just make sure that everybody is okay you know you're checking on your neighbors more than what you used to you're checking on family members a little bit more than what you used to you're checking on friends now but the, the COVID, the COVID has has really opened up a lot of a, a lot of my eyes to different things. Um, one more question. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think at some point we will stop wearing masks at school? I, I don't see it. I don't see it this year. I don't see it happening this year because. Um, maybe next year, but I think we will be in mask all year. Um, it's just, it's not getting better. There are some, some places in the, in the country and in the world that are getting a little worse now. Um, people are getting a little more cautious. I do know they have relaxed some of the rules, um, but they have not relaxed all of the rules. So I don't see us being without face masks until possible next year, until the vaccine comes out and that people are seeing that, it, that it's actually working, people are getting better. So we may be, I definitely this year, we will be in masks all, all school year. I'm prepared for that. Um, my last question for you, Mr. Lewis, we have freshmen in here, but we also have a variety of sophomores and juniors as well. What would be some final words of wisdom that you would wanna share with them as they're continuing um, their high school career and their lives after high school? I'll start with the freshmen. Um, I, like I tell all freshmen, your first year, your first semester, your first year, school, first year of school, it's the most important year at all. I, I call it building a foundation. It's just like building a house. You know, you have to have a foundation and you need to have all A's and B's your first freshman year. It gets a little harder because you get a little older, you get things happen in your life, things change. Um, you're, you're actually more open to different things in, that's happening around you. So the freshman year to me is the most important year because it's gonna make or break you. You're either gonna come in and do well or you're gonna fail and you're gonna struggle for your high school. So you have to build a foundation as a freshman and that foundation is with A's and B's. And then as you move up to your sophomore year, you just build on it. You start laying the blocks, laying the bricks and making sure that you're building your house so that your house structure is stable, you know, is wind resistant. It has all those things in it that a house has, but you're still building on it and you're maintaining and actually you're getting better. Your junior year is where you got to start thinking a little bit about what you want to do. And in the same time, continue building on your foundation so that you can have a portfolio to present to colleges if that's what you want to do. 
Um, college is not for everybody. I totally, I, I used to think college was for everybody. I totally now know that college is not for everybody. I've been convinced. I've seen it. I actually have my own son who didn't go to college, but he's now a firefighter. So I know college is not for everybody now. Um, but as I was growing up, the only thing we knew was go to college, go to college, go to college. So as your junior year, build that found, continue building it and that portfolio, because you're going to be presented in the summertime, your portfolio to colleges. And, you know, for colleges trying for, to gain an entry into the college you want to build, you want to go to. Um, a lot of times you actually are accepted into college before your senior year even starts. So that's why your first three years are very, very important. You know, it's not just your senior year where I got to get all good grades. Well, you have to do that your freshman, sophomore, and junior year. And then when you get to your senior year, it should be rewarding and fun. You know, you should just be managing your classes, maintaining your grades. You, normally, if you're going to school, you know where you're going. You've already passed all the tests you need to do for the state of Florida, ACT, SAT also. And you should just be having fun, enjoying yourself your senior year, preparing for college. You know, and if, you, if you're fortunate, you can take on some, um, some classes at Polk State, do some early entry classes. You know, that's also great. But you have to remember those classes follow you to college. So you need to be successful in them. D's and C's are not good, A's and B's, because that follows you to your college. And you don't want to go to college with uh, a 1.5 or 2.0. You at least want to have a 3.0 or better as you're starting, starting your college if you're taking classes for early entry. But that's what I would just um, kind of tell all the kids that are in there today from a freshman all the way to a senior. Your senior year should be fun. You should have a lot of fun. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Lewis, for your time today. I really appreciate you sharing your insight with our students today. No problem. Anytime. Thank you. Have a great day. We'll wave bye. Bye, bye Mr. Thank Lewis. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.